Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. My guest today is Gabriel Klingman. I first met Gabriel when he was giving a presentation on SEO and digital marketing. Gabriel shared his experiences successfully launching products at two startup companies. At the end of the presentation, he started talking about his new book, and that's when he really grabbed my attention. I was surprised to learn it was all about leadership, specifically motivating millennials. Gabriel had worked in management at Starbucks and had over a decade of experience leading young people. I'm excited to have him on the show today to talk about this important leadership topic. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Gabriel Klingman. Gabriel is a speaker, author, consultant, and podcast host. He has over a decade of experience building and leading teams. He started his leadership journey at Starbucks, where he managed over 120 employees from Texas to Maine. His new book, Opportunity Switch, provides a simple formula for motivating millennials, minimizing turnover, and creating a high-performance culture. I'm excited to have him on the show to get his take on leadership, especially leading millennials. So, Gabriel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here, my friend. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show because I am interested in this one particular subject, and that is about mm. leadership and leading millennials, because that's something that, uh, <laughs> as an older manager, I think I, I, can, I can learn something from you. So, But before we dive into the book, I... One of the things I noticed right away is that you have a really interesting background. So a lot of times when I'm looking at my guests, I'm looking at their background. But you you were a touring musician. Then you became mm-hmm. a Starbucks manager. Then you, mm-hmm. you really became a digital marketer, right? Doing some amazing things on digital marketing. And now you've moved to author, leadership author. So tell us about your career journey. How did you end up doing all these various things in such a short amount of time? So it, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, it is a lot of different things. And just when you say it like that, they all, it seems so scattered, it seems so out of place. Um, for me, the one kind of like thir- through line was the human connection part. Mm. So as a musician, I'm up on stage. I To this day, um, I no longer travel, um, but I'm still a musician. I still play weekly. And like at the people I can connect with, not only through my music, but afterwards, um, that is why I loved it. Uh, as a manager, I'm sure you know, you have your team. You get to connect with your team. Obviously, you get to connect with your customers. Same thing. Um, as a digital marketer, it's the same idea. You're connecting a brand with a customer. It's a, it's a different type of human connection, but it's a similar thing. And literally, as a speaker, consultant, it's all, that's kind of the through line. So that's kind of why, where I took this wild journey and how it all kind of ties in together. Well, I know we're going to get along fine because I say that leadership is a people business. And what you said is the common thread is people through this whole thing. (laughs) Interesting. Very interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when did you um, start begin? When did you begin to understand about leadership and about the power of leaders? And did you have mentors or role models? When did like leadership become a topic that, that interested you? Great question. Um, For years, it didn't. I like I am not a natural leader. I am the furthest thing from it, in all honesty. Um, I grew up, I was a complete people pleaser, like 100%. I cared about your opinion. I cared about your opinion of of you, your opinion of me. Um, When I first got my, like my first leadership position, I sucked. I was horrible. And it's because I cared so much about other people's opinions that like I couldn't hold them to a standard. I couldn't say, hey, you're slacking and I know you can do better. I couldn't do that because I all I was like 
buried under this weight of mm. trying to please them and make them happy and not realizing that that was actually making them miserable. It was making me miserable. It was letting down my team, letting down my boss, and it was not helping them. Mm. So that's kind of growing up. I was super people pleaser. I then, um, my first kind of mentor officially, uh, was Laura Stacchino at Starbucks. She has left the company, but now she got up, um, she was the one, like my first manager, she just hired me. She led through example. She never really like sat me down and said, Hey, this is how you do it. This is what you do. But what she did is she connected, she mm-hmm. led her teams and she connected in a way that I admired. And I'm like, regardless of whatever this is called, I want that. And I want mm-hmm. to learn that. And that was leadership. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, that's what, that's what I'm hooked. I love it. Really interesting. So I always say that uh, as leaders, we make an impact, either positive or negative. Mm-hmm. And, and in this mm-hmm. case, just by her actions, just by the way she led, it interested you to learn more about it. Hundred percent. From a huge people pleaser to all of the sudden, like now, this is this is my career. This is what I do. Is I go and I teach leadership. It's like a huge change because of her actions, because of the impact that she had. You are absolutely right. I love that. I love that. It's that, you know, it's the pebble in the water and the waves that ripple mm. off and, and what impact that you make through for different people's lives. And, you you know, you never know that the one thing you do or the, you know, the one person that you help, what that impact mm. that person will make going forward. It's so really so interesting. True. Yeah. It's so true. Wow. That's really cool. So, so it sounds like, I mean, one of my questions was going to be how, what did you learn about yourself uh, as, as you moved into leadership roles? Well, one thing you mentioned already is, kind of moving away from being a people pleaser, but anything else you learned as you kind of became engaged and you started becoming a leader yourself and you had 120 employees that are spread all over the country. What were some things, what, are, what how did you grow as a leader? Um, I, honestly, I think the biggest thing is for me anyway, the biggest thing for me was making that transition from realizing that the idea of leadership isn't what I thought. I had this Mm. idea and I had this picture. Leadership was this like militant authoritarian (laughs) style that you are just full of exuding power. And that's how you get people to do what you want them to do. And kind of having that mental shift to like, no, you don't, that's not a leader. That's a dictator. Mm. And going from there and saying, okay, well, at the same time, being this huge people pleaser that I was, that's not a leader either. And that's not helpful. And realizing that there is actually a fine line between the two. Yes, you have to hold the line, but yes, you have to care about your employees and finding that line. And that by caring about them, you can encourage them to push that line and go further than they could before. That was kind of the biggest and most difficult mental shift for me. Mm, That's powerful. Yeah. I think, you know, when I look at leadership, there's Balance is a really key part of being a leader, right? You can be you can be overly cruel and you're not effective. You can be overly friendly and you're not effective, right? You can be a micromanager and you can be ineffective, or you can be what I call the absent manager, where you're not involved at all and you can be ineffective. So, a lot of times we play a balancing game um, of, of of all these things. You know, if you take any any one of these characteristics, you can become you know to an extreme it's not effect. You're not effective as a leader. So it sounds like you found that, that perfect balance uh, between being, you know, a people pleaser, but also being a, a dictator or, you know, being, yeah. you know, this is the way it's going to be type of thing. Exactly. I don't, I wouldn't say, I don't know about perfect. I mean, that's <laughs> a strong word, but I have certainly um, my mentor, like I said, Laura Sakino, she, uh, she walked that line. She walked it very gracefully and so I'm very fortunate to be able to look up, see what she did, see how she handled situations and kind of fit, like dissect and understand the system that she used to make these decisions and to make sure she wasn't going too far in either direction. I love it. That's great. So, you know, we, we, we all have been to Starbucks and most of us have been <laughs> to Starbucks. Um, I'm not a Starbucks guy. As John, uh, we, we have yes. a mutual friend, John, John Brubaker. <laughs> he loves Starbucks. I'm a Dunkin' Donuts guy, but that's all right. Um, but I, I do uh, go to I do go to Starbucks, especially when I'm traveling overseas. When I see Starbucks, I'm mm, like, oh, that's America. I can go there and get a cup mm, of coffee, right? So, so do you mind if I ask? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So why is it that you go to Starbucks? So this has always fascinated me. Why is it that you choose Starbucks when you go overseas? 
Well, like I said, I, well, because I go to China a lot. I've been to China mm-hmm. a lot. And you can't mm-hmm. find, you know, A, you can't find coffee. And B, you can't find mm-hmm. good coffee. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, Starbucks usually is an indicator that, ah, there's a, there's something I'm going to go and I'm going to get a taste from home. I'm going to taste something mm-hmm. that, that tastes like, I, you know, that I'm, that I'm used yeah. something I'm used to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, see, comfort, that's what comfort. I was wondering. You're, you're comfortable, exactly. right? You're going back to a comfort place. Right. And now that's not to take this into a whole different direction, but that's beautiful because when we work, we're going to be talking about leading millennials. And what's so fascinating is Starbucks has done that so well that they have created this culture around their company or within their company that you can go to any Starbucks and you're going to get an incredible experience. And most of the employees are millennials. Most of them are Mm. people who are showing up, they're getting minimum wage or a little above, and they're like not doing, they don't have a huge financial incentive to do their job, yet a corporation was able to take this type of employee Mm. and take this person who shouldn't have the motivation and say, you know what, we're going to give you an innate motivation. We're going to show you a way to motivate you. That's not through financial. Mm. And then they were able to do that and spread that all across the world. That's crazy. That blows my mind. I'm so glad that you kind of brought that up. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you know, and I can tell you, having I have uh, I have Starbucks mugs from from all over the world, all over Europe and and Asia and what have you. And um, but yeah, it's the same. You get the same experience no matter where you go. And the people behind the counter are from that nationality, but you're still getting the same quality, mm-hmm. the same experience everywhere you go. So it's very very interesting. Yeah. So I love um, that. And. Um, yeah, so you're kind of touched on it. I mean, there's a culture uh, at Starbucks. So we're used to we're used to Starbucks. Those of us have gone there. What's the culture behind the counter like? I mean, you mentioned it, <laughs> a lot of young people working, and mm-hmm. so. But what's that culture like? Uh, what's it like to work at a company like Starbucks? Mm. Um, it is that's so. That's a very interesting question because it goes two different ways. Um, one, I have worked at some Starbucks that are just complete spirals, right? You work at a store and everyone, there's tons of gossip, tons of fighting, tons of um, just clashing, and no one is there to show, go the extra mile. And you often see that the store, it, there's physical ramifications for that too, right? The store tends to be more run down. Um, employees are gonna be more rude to the customers. We've all been to those stores. Um, but what's amazing about Starbucks is out of the 12, I think there's like 12 or 13 different stores that I've gone to um, all across the East Coast, the majority, the very large majority of them are the opposite. They're the mm. stores that are incredible, the stores that are welcoming, that encourage growth and encourage holding the line. Um, they have something that I think this makes a world of a difference. They have something that I've I've called the 360, um, 360 degree leadership and 360 degree accountability. And it's you're holding, not only do you hold your people accountable, like your equals, you hold your employees accountable, but at any point you can hold your boss accountable Mm. at any point as a barista, I could walk into Starbucks and tell my shift, Hey, you're not running this shift appropriately. Here are the standards and you're not meeting that. Mm. And being open to that, they really have this culture of welcoming this uh, feedback, welcoming this challenge from everyone. Interesting. So that's, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, I'm a manufacturing guy, but, you know, I lead manufacturing business, but that was always the one thing that we tried to push was that anyone can stop the line, right? Anyone Mm. can say, hey, this isn't safe. Hey, this isn't, the the quality isn't right. Um, I'm stopping the line right here. And we give Mm. people we empower the people to stop the line if there's anything they feel uncomfortable about or it's not being done right. So almost the same thing that any anyone behind the counter, any any barista can go to the manager and say, "Look, we're not we're not holding the standard here." Absolutely, exact same thing. Different industry, same exact principle. I love it. Now, that's very cool. I, I had no idea. So that's really neat to uh, neat to hear that. So so if my latte isn't right. Okay? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Even the customers can be like, hey, this was wrong. You did something wrong. Exactly. Right. Amazing. Right. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. So so let's talk about your new book, Opportunity Switch. Mm-hmm. Why did you feel like you wanted to write down all these ideas, what you learned? I mean, 
And then who's the audience for it? Is it the younger leader? Is it an older leader like myself? So give me a little insight into why you wrote the book and who you hope, who the audience is really. For sure. So the reason I wrote the book was um, one to kind of document a lot of my own journey, document a lot of my own system for how I've developed and how I've led these people. Um, But at the same time, the other reason is because I have worked under some really terrible managers. (laughs) Um, We all have, everyone has, right? We've all worked under someone that just They showed up and they barely did anything. They had their favorite two or three employees. It didn't matter what anyone else did. These people were the best. Um, And it's so demoralizing. It's so demotivating. And I talk to a lot of my friends still work at Starbucks. So I talk to them. I go there often. We'll talk and they'll vent to me and they're telling me these things. Of like, oh, this is what my manager did today. And this is what they did today. And oh, my supervisor did this. And all I'm thinking about is, oh my God. These two, like if this manager only knew that Mm. if they changed these three things, if they did this one thing differently and more than that, like the biggest obstacle for that tends to be, oh, well, I don't have any money because a lot of the solutions tend to be like, oh, it's going to cost a lot of money to try and fix your team's performance. But the reason I wrote Opportunity Switch is because the system that we've kind of developed doesn't cost a penny. It's all about changing your approach to leadership. It's not about having like a foosball Friday or a pizza Wednesday or whatever it is that you're hoping to engage and increase the performance of your team. None of that matters when your cohesion isn't there. I love it. I love it. So what you're saying is the the cornhole game I bought for our factory is not going to do it. I actually have to lead lead my employees and build a team. You know what? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You're 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 close. Okay. (laughs) So so and and then um so you know in a way you're saying that you're, you're hoping that some of these managers that are struggling, leaders that are struggling, they'll read this book and sort of go ah they'll get you know the lights will go on and say oh this is what I'm missing or Maybe I've been going about this the wrong way. So it's a way to help uh, help leaders be more effective. Is that, is that exactly. am I summarizing that right? Absolutely. That's a great way to summarize it. Yeah. Okay. And now, is it is it written more for an audience like myself, like an older manager? Because I know in the title, you got me on the title because it said, you know, you talked about, I think it was a subtitle though. It's, uh, it's, it's motivating millennials. And that's something that mm-hmm. I have noticed personally that is different. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from a, I'm, you know, I'm an older generation, but leading millennials is a whole different world. But um, is it meant for older managers uh, to read this book or is it meant for everyone? So it's really funny that you say that. Um, that my original intent wasn't for older managers. That wasn't my initial thought. Um, my initial thought was, man, I wish I had this book when I started. Mm, like I, I know 10, 000, I know 10, 20 people that could use this book right now. Wow, that's um, good. Mm-hmm. But a re- the more um, I've kind of marketed it and the more people I've talked to and more people I kind of give the book and get in connection with, it seems to resonate a lot more with some of the older leaders. Uh, and I believe it's because this strategy is something that really connects with millennials. And it's something that there seems to be, um, how do I say this? It's something that really connects with millennials. And it's something that is different than what connected with previous generations. I, there seems I, to be this disconnect. There is, there is a, there is a major disconnect, mm. and um, I know my my son is entering the workforce, and he gets, you know, he they they have like this cold brew keg, and they bring him, you know, they have on Fridays they'll bring you know mixed drinks to their office, and I'm like, wait, oh, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't get any of that when I, when I was his age. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I'm so I'm seeing it from I I have he's he's probably younger than the millennial, but I have a young you know, a son entering the workforce as an accountant, and I'm seeing all the extras that they do to attract talent and to, Mm -hmm. and I'm just like, wait, maybe I'm not doing some of these things in in my company. So it's really interesting to see, see it from his perspective. So, you know, what, what makes millennials so unique? Why, you know, sometimes (laughs) the other, you know, a lot of times they can be the butt of jokes and what have you, but I, I really do think that they are a powerful force in the workforce today. And they're, but they are, they are different and you're, you know, you're kind of in that age group. So what makes millennials so unique and so special? What's, what's, what is it about them? That's a great question. Um, 
how do I want to answer this one? So <laughs> you're talking for all millennials now, so be careful. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, so my the way how do I want to word this? I think I'm gonna word it like this. Millennials are extremely unique for a good handful of reasons, but one of the biggest is that they are willing to work for free. Mm. Now that's crazy. Now no, that no, isn't to say you, yeah, yeah, that isn't to say you shouldn't pay your millennials or anything <laughs> like that. If anyone's listening, like don't be cutting, <laughs> don't be saying, Hey, cut all the pay. But what, what I mean by that is they're willing to put in all of these extra hours. If it's something that's meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that meaning comes from the work itself, whether that meaning comes from the company that they work for, or whether that meaning comes from the person they were that the person that they work mm -hmm. for, that connection. They're willing to put in all of these extra hours mm -hmm. without pay because it's meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the biggest differences. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Is your boss a jerk? I understand you're in the hospital, but I'm going to need you to come in today. Do they lack any ability to actually lead people? Oh, it's fine. I'll, I'll just find somebody else that can do it, okay? John is offering a new service just for you. For only $10, he will anonymously mail a copy of his best-selling book, I Have the Watch, to your boss with a personal note. Go to IHaveTheWatch.com and enter the discount code BOSS at checkout. Some of the things that really drive millennial and drive specifically millennial performance is belonging. That, mm. is that in and of itself, if, if when you're listening, if you take nothing else away, take away that millennials long to belong. Mm. And it's not just millennials. Every human does, but millennials especially. So how can you create a culture of your belonging within your team? within your organization, within your industry, right? Mm -hmm. How can you create a culture of belonging from your organization and your customers? How can you make them both feel like they belong? Um, that's one. Another one we had talked about a second ago is meaning. Um, and that meaning, a lot of people think that if a job isn't, uh, if, if a job isn't being like a heart surgeon, then it's not meaningful. Mm -hmm. Right. You, a lot of people think you have to have this really uh, directly changing the world type of job in order to have meaning behind it. But you don't. But you don't. And that's what's crazy. And a lot of millennials know this, um, but not a lot of companies are taking advantage of it. So no, it's in the interesting. Book, yeah, no, I was going to say, it's just interesting because one of the things I just wrote an article probably three, two, three or four weeks ago that talking about mm. what I call worthwhile work. And one of the lessons I learned early on as, a, as an early manufacturing manager was that, um, you know, most of your people, when I would ask them what they do, they would say, well, I make, I make, I make this part. Oh, what do you do? Well, I plate this part. What do you do? Well, I mill mm -hmm. this part. I said, what does a part do? And they said, well, I don't know. And mm -hmm. what, what we weren't doing well when I first got to this plant was they weren't connecting their work to what we were doing as a company in the industry. We were, we were helping electric utilities keep the lights on. A very important. We were keeping the lights on in, in, um, in hospitals and schools. And we, we made wow. sure that elevator didn't stop halfway up with school children in it, right? So we mm. were supplying power, right, to, yeah. to this country. And we set about to, to teach people what they were doing and why what they were doing made a difference in how, how our products performed and how our customers used them. And, and it was almost like um, the attitude changed almost overnight because they felt like they were doing something <laughs> worthwhile. There was meaning in what they were doing. They weren't just making a widget. They were making yeah. a circuit breaker that kept the lights on. So we connected their work to what we were doing as a company. And, and that really sparked a lot of morale improvement, a lot of excitement that we kind of coalesced around this idea of like, we're helping keep the lights on. This is amazing. This is great. You know? And uh, come on, so, come on. that's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. I love that. It's exactly right. Yeah. So worthwhile work and having meaning. That's a very, um, very, very important. And, and, um, and I do love what you say about feel, the feeling like you're belonging. And, and I guess um, I would say this is that, you know, 
I think you're right. As far as if I'm thinking about the millennials that I work with, they do feel that they feel like they want to be part of something. And then, uh, but it's also like that with everybody else. But the one thing I was going to say is like, I think too, in the digital age we live in, we don't feel like we belong. We're sort of disconnected, especially, you know, in COVID too, is even more, we're disconnected, you know, we're, we're on our device, right? And we're not having those personal relationships anymore. And I think work can be a place where you can go and have friends and you can do things together and you can be part of, I mean, in, in my company, we say we're more like family than we are like a company. And I think it can be a family for some people. In fact, some people might have their best experiences at work and they might have a troubled home life, right? But they come Absolutely. to work and there's stability. And I'm part, I'm part of this team. I'm part of this Starbucks store. I'm part of this factory. I'm part of this group. That's exactly right. With so many of the employees that I've had over the years, that was their story. And that was my story when I first started out. Like home life was not nothing great. It was nothing to write home about, I guess is a way to say it. It was nothing special. Um, and it was really rough. And so going to work, that was my family. That was, those were my people. And over the years, that just kind of grew and grew. And my team felt the same exact way. That's great. I love that. So the other thing is, um, <clears throat> you know, you talk about, you know, turnover being an issue. So, you mm-hmm. know, in your opinion, why do employees leave companies? What are what are companies doing wrong that 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 you know that creates so much turnover? Are they just not doing the things we we're just early talking about earlier? Or are there other other reasons why companies are uh, missing out on on keeping employees for the long term? I, that's a great question. Um, I think when you, when you when you do a Google search, what will happen is you'll because we've all done this. Um, it's the elephant in the room. We've all done this. Why do employees leave? You search it in Google. What comes up? They, employees leave because of managers. Super true. Everyone, yeah, very, very true. A ca- not a caveat, a different angle from that, though, is employees, yes, they leave because of how managers treat them, but they also leave because of how managers treat their other employees. Now, what I mean by that is if you're a manager and you're treating your best employees as if they're nothing special and you're giving special attention, special grace and special um, work towards the employees that are just barely struggling, then your best employees are going to leave. Absolutely going to leave. And the reason is because they're putting in so much more work and they're not getting appreciated for it. Mm. They don't see that. What they see is the person who's barely doing it, who's putting in half mm. the amount of work and is getting all of the attention and all of the appreciation and all yeah. the like, special care. And yeah. so, yes, it's how you, how as a manager, how you treat your employees, but it's not just how you treat them, but it's also how you treat your other employees. That's really, that's really neat that you said that. Cause I think there's a great book that said, uh, it's called uh, first break all the rules and it was written by the Gallup organization. And one of the things they say is that most managers spend, uh, uh, too much of their time with their bad employees trying to get them mm. to become better. And what this book says is break the rules, spend your time with your best employees because mm-hmm. a lot of your bad wow. employees likely aren't going to change, especially if they're above a certain age, right? They're, they're kind of, they're, they're, this is, this is the, who they are. Spend time with your best employees. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think we do that. Mm-hmm. We sometimes, and I saw this in corporate America, when you have really good employees, you kind of leave them alone, let them do their things. And you spend a lot of time trying to get the poor performers up. And then that, that good employee is like, well, you know, you don't spend any time with me. You're, you know, you just expect me to do all the work and you don't ever really appreciate Mm me, you know, and if I'm not appreciated here, I'm going to go someplace where I am appreciated. Right. And that's a big part of it. So, wow. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I see that. And that's a, and so I think you're right. It's not just, how managers treat employees is how they to treat other employees as well. Mm-hmm. I and mean, it's one other thing too. I always notice too, when there's a poor performer and management mm-hmm. doesn't take action, it sends mm-hmm. the message, right? That come on, this, is, come on. this is acceptable behavior, <laughs> right? And so the person who's working hard is like, look at this person. He's, he's not yeah. doing anything and there's no consequences. So why should I try so hard? Why should come I put on. in the extra effort? Why should I follow the rules? Mm-hmm. That's a big Man. problem I see too when you don't take yeah. action against a non-performer. That was something I struggled with. Like I said at the beginning, huge people pleaser when I started. Like that's my natural tendencies. And so when I first got into management, man, that was like my biggest struggle. 
is I let everyone go by. And then all of a sudden everyone's performance just started to go do, 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 yep. because there was, there were no consequences. I had no, right. I didn't hold anyone accountable for it. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. I'm still, you know, I, I tell people I'm a four strikes and you're out guy. So I still am a very <laughs> okay, forgiving yeah. person, but eventually I have to say, I have to let people go. And it's a hard thing to do. Yeah. But I have done it uh, a lot in my career, but I usually give yeah. people many chances to to turn the situation around. Or sometimes they're in the wrong position, right? They're in a, they're in mm. a role that they're not really fit for. And sometimes I've got to mm. put people, you know, I got I've got a square peg in a round hole. I got to move that person to a better position that is more suited to their skill sets and their desires. And mm-hmm. sometimes that's 100%. all you have to do and things work, you know. Exactly. It's so true. It's so true. Yeah, no, that's I love I love that. So, um, you know, you were talking about high performance cultures. What what when you see a high performance culture or you're around a high performance culture, what does it feel like? What does it look like? Uh, I so I really love answering this question because I think I answer it differently than a lot of people. Um, a lot of people, if you look at like a high performance culture, you kind of have this idea what you think about and what, or at least what I've always thought about is, okay, we're going to have these like top athletes and it's, it's going to be these Navy SEALs. It's going to be like these people are hitting it out of the park every single time. And that's high performance culture in the real world. That's not the case, <laughs> right? Like here in actually in America day to day, you are lucky if you have a team like that. What I like to say is that is a team of high performers. It's not a high perf- necessarily a high performance. I culture. agree. Yeah. Two very different things, right? So what I typically look is I say, okay, let's look at the team that you have. When I think of high performance, I'm like, let's look at the team that you have. Let's look at the outcomes that they are currently getting. Now, if this, if they are getting probably 60% of what they potential could be getting, you're getting about 60%, then right off the bat, we know that everything that you are doing is getting 60%. So that means if you don't change what you're doing, you will only get 60% from this group of people. So let's change what you're doing and let's see if we can increase that. Let's change yeah. what you're doing. And all of a sudden that 60% then becomes 80%. Okay. That is a huge jump. And I've seen this time and time again. It's not like a bunch of people come in and every single individual becomes an individual high performer, but it's everyone. You've created a culture of high performance mm-hmm. and everyone kind of raises that bar themselves. Yeah, I think Jocko Willink says that there's no such thing as a bad team, but there's a lot of things that it has a lot to do with a bad manager. A bad Come leader. on. So you can take a bad team and you can make you mm-hmm. can raise their performance level just by how you motivate them, how you how you interact with them. It's interesting on my last uh, no, not last podcast guest, but two podcast guests ago, I was had a psychiatrist on who works with uh, elite uh, athletes, uh, Olympians, NCAA mm-hmm. teams. And what, one of the things he said was really interesting, and I, I'm still trying to process it, but he said that mm-hmm. the dis- difference between a great team and an mm-hmm. elite team is not necessarily talent, just like you said, mm-hmm. but he says the one thing they have different is they love each other. There's a bond, oh. there's a connection, and they are doing it not so much to win, but because they're doing it because they're standing shoulder to shoulder between people they love and they, they, they want to do it together. So there's a bond. Mm. And I saw some of that in the military when I was in, when I was in the Navy. Um, but I'm also seeing it in my small company, right? I'm seeing that we have this tight bond. I mentioned earlier, we're like family and um, we're more family than we are company. And so some of, one of those connections, and I'm just curious to know your thoughts about that. It, when you have an elite or high-performing culture, do you see that? Do you see that, you know, there, is there deep relationships? Is there a bond that, that's there? 100%. 100%. So I am so glad that you said that. I'm actually going to go back after this and listen to that podcast because that is beautiful. I've actually, I've never heard it worded like that, that there is this bond of love, but like that makes so much sense. Um, how I've always seen it. And actually in Opportunity Switch in the book, I outline it in two separate ways. Um, I say a, a high performance team so creating that high-performance culture and a high-performance team, what that and what that requires is a feeling of belonging and a feeling of connection. Mm-hmm. There's a, the entire book is it becomes ten different feelings that you have to feel to create that high performance. And belonging and connection are 
huge. I've seen it time and time again at mm-hmm. different stores that I've worked at. I've seen it at different stores um, that I've just showed up for the day. I've seen it in different sp- any teams um, in and out of different bands. Makes, that alone makes such a difference. I love and that, that alone doesn't cost a penny either, which is no. crazy. No, that's it. So it's interesting. You know, I've been, you know, I have an MBA and I've been leading businesses for 30 years and I've been in the, the trenches of leadership. And one thing is interesting is so when you go to business school and you, you know, I have a couple of master's degrees and, and they teach you about leadership. Congrats, man. <laughs> it's always nice. about, but it's always about, um, it's always about the numbers and, and it's yeah. always about the, um, uh, I don't know, the hard skills, right? And they mm-hmm. saw, when they talk about people skills, they say, that's just soft skills and and they sort of put it off like that's not that important we're going to focus on we're going to teach you about accounts receivable we're going to talk to you about cash flow we're going to talk to you about a p l mm-hmm. statement we're going to talk to you about strategy and, and how to develop a vision statement we're going to talk to you about content marketing and all these like things you need to know mm-hmm. what you don't spend any time talking about is people and mm-hmm. would you say that the high performing cultures that you work with or you've seen the ones that have the belonging connection are they actually getting financial results as well? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> World of it, which is, it's funny that you say that. Um, yeah. It makes such a difference, such a difference financially as well. Um, and literally, so all, yeah, I'll go ahead and share some of this stuff. Um, when I first started implementing this stuff, right. I went from like being a people pleaser, like here are our numbers where they should have been before I took the leadership. Then also I take leadership and then whoo, we dropped like a good, I think it was about it was years ago now, but it had to be about five to 10% drop, um, which is pretty, pretty dramatic just for like a store week over week for no other reason than you have a new leader. That's, that's unfortunate. Um, and then what happened is I'm like, okay, I started learning, like, what are the feelings that these employees need to feel in order to develop this culture in order to be a high performing team. And as I started implementing that, all of a sudden we went from being 80, I think we were the 82nd um, percentile for uh, customer service to the 91st um, Mm -hmm. percentile. We went uh, from doing, I think it was like 1300 a day to doing 1700 a day in number of transactions. Uh, we went from our, the average price ticket costing, um, it was like something like 250 to it got an extra dollar per ticket on average. And I say these things to say, as a team, it makes such a difference, it makes such a difference. It's not just these soft skills, but it's absolutely a financial difference. So if you take care of the soft skills, you get the hard numbers, you get the results. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's, exactly. It's a, sometimes people have a hard time understanding that. So, you know, and, uh, and that, that's what I, my experience as well is. So when we've made connections and when we, we built a, a team and we built a family, the results always came, right? It, it was because we did it uh, as uh, my, you know, my former guest said, we did it because we cared for each other and we were standing shoulder to shoulder. We were fighting for each other. And um, there was something about that. So, yeah, yeah. So it's good stuff. So that's exciting. (laughs) So in your opinion, like, you know, Mm. I've been asking all my, all my uh, guests and and I think, you know, at some point I'm going to have this great collection. So, uh, but (laughs) what are some characteristics of a great leader in your mind? Mm. A great leader. I would say um, there's two in particular, and we actually have, we've touched on implied on some of them today, but two in particular, one is a great leader is a follower. Um, and what I mean by that is a great leader is someone who is willing to get down in the dirt with you. Someone who's willing to stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and willing to work with you and not just have a whip and say, Hey, go do this. They're not a, a dictator, but they're there to make sure that you can do your job to the best possible ability. Um, and right with that, I'd say a great leader is one who listens, one who doesn't just um, speak and who doesn't just listen to uh, hear, but listens to understand, doesn't just listen to, to reply, but listens so they can have a greater understanding and then move forward with that. And those are by far two of the biggest things that I've personally found. Yeah, I agree. hundred percent. And I would say today I was out on the shop floor listening and helping 
build product because <laughs> <laughs> I believe in these things too. So every day, that's what I'm talking you know, about. Get out there. I, uh, if you ever saw my steel toe shoes, you'd say this is not somebody who spends a lot of time in his office. So <laughs> I like to get exactly. on the shop floor and uh, I like to help out. And you know, when I'm helping, I'm listening and I'm talking and yeah. we're communicating. And they feel like the boss mm-hmm. isn't you know, special, you know, he's willing yeah, to exactly. come out here. She's willing to come out here mm-hmm. and help out. So I think yep. that's, uh, I think it sends a powerful message that I'm not above you. We're in this together. Mm-hmm. So. My first mentor, what she, Laura Stikino, what she had said to me many times, she just ingrained it into all of her employees was that she said, I will never ask you to do something that I will not do myself. Mm-hmm. And there are multiple days I'd show up at work and she is on her hands and knees scrubbing underneath the fridge and like pulling all of this stuff out and scrubbing the floors because that's something we would do. But she was in the position where that was her responsibility at that moment. So she did it. She's not yeah. going to pass that off. Amazing. Yeah. And it, you, you, get a, you get a sense of who that person is just by watching them. And, uh, and you know, what they're willing to do. I love that. That's such, that's so powerful. Yeah. So, um, so what's next for you? You've got the book now, what's the status of the book? It's in pre-order right now as, as I understand it's, it. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So it'll be released. Um, what month we are in September, right? Yes. I had to, I'm like thinking about it. It's been a crazy year. Um, so it'll officially be released. Um, I believe it's going to be mid next month. So it's got like about a month left in pre-order. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then copies will officially start going out. Okay. I'm excited. So how can people find out more about uh, you, your podcast, your book? We didn't really talk too much about your podcast, but <laughs> you've got a podcast out there as well. But how can people yeah. find out more about you and what you do? Fantastic. Um, if you go to uh, gabrielklingman.com, that's my own name, um, or go to flwacademy.com. Uh, that one has a lot of leadership training and we do tend to do on FLW. If you're looking for coaching, consulting, or speaking, GabrielKlingman.com, you can fill out some forms and we'll get in contact right through there. Okay, great. And we'll put uh, links to those in the show notes. So take a look for those links and we'll have them there. So, well, this has been really powerful. So I, 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 um, I'm excited for what I heard today, because I think in some cases I'm doing some things right but in some cases, maybe I'm not putting value enough in some of these things, especially as it relates to millennials. So I really like what you talked about as far as, you know, millennials want to be part of something that has, they're doing work that has meaning. I think that's something that's resonating with me. And the other thing is about, um, they long to be a part of something, to belong. And so what am I doing to make sure that I'm creating that environment where they do belong? So, and, and I think the other thing that really stood out to me and I know I'll read about, read about in your book, is that these things can be done with very little money. It doesn't take a lot of money to develop this type mm-hmm. of high-performance culture. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's a huge misconception, um, is that you think to have this high-performance culture, you're going to have to shell out so much money. And it, it requires a lot more work to actually have a high-performance culture, but it's not going to require much money at all. Yeah, that's great to hear, especially now in the in a strange year of 2020. And, you know, budgets <laughs> exactly. are tight. You can create that work environment without a lot yeah. of money, a lot of investment. Exactly. That's exactly. Great. Well, thank you very much, Gabriel. I really appreciate all of your wisdom, insight, and I and I'm really looking forward to getting the book and and digging into it a lot deeper. Thank you so much for having me on here. It has been a absolute blast. I've enjoyed it as well. So. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying, take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care.